Christ. Welcome to all of you. I see a number of dignitaries here for the audience. Okay. I'm going to introduce and someone whose name and word reflects the fact that today, uh, on a weekend, in the middle of the summer holidays, in the run of them, uh, we have ambassadors, students, CEOs, um, international development experts, and most importantly, I see all these people full now. And this is understandable. But as my daughter is one of the most influential thinkers in the field of business strategy and competitiveness. He's really among the first to have married together the analytical side of economics with the more practical approaches of business. And the reason he was able to do this is his not a unique background. I learned from him that he was studying engineering at Princeton and went to do an MBA at Harvard. And while doing that, he was pursuing doctoral courses in economics uh, at Harvard itself. And then became full professor at Harvard, which is the highest professional recognition that can be awarded to a Harvard faculty member. He's currently the Bishop William Lawrence University professor based at Harvard Business School. And in 2001, Harvard Business School and Harvard University jointly created the Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness, which is dedicated to furthering Professor Mark's work. Now, this ability to bring together different disciplines is reflected in Professor Porter's work, which spans issues of competitive strategy, the competitiveness and economic development of nations, states, and regions, and the application of competitive principles to social problems such as healthcare, environment, and corporate responsibility. He's the author of over 17 books and 125 articles. And his course, Microeconomics of Competitiveness, is taught in partnership with more than 80 other universities from every continent and chairs the new CEO workshop, which is a Harvard Business School program for newly appointed CEOs. The workshop, which is by invitation only, focuses on the challenges that new CEOs face in assuming leadership. In his research, he has introduced big two ideas in business strategy competitiveness of nations and regions, and competition in society. So the supporter is major work there, competitive strategy, techniques for analyzing industries and competitors, is now in its 63rd edition and has been translated into 19 languages. Uh, his second major strategy work was competitive advantage, creating and sustaining superior performance, and Professor's ninth, uh, Professor Porter's 1990 work, The Comparative Advantage of Nations, which actually I have, and I was taking courses in the of the business school, that was one of the right things we did. And among the ideas that Professor Porter introduced was the whole concept of clusters, which have now become fashionable and have taken on. And because of this, Professor Porter has been asked to serve a number of corporations, including large risk multinational firms like Caterpillar, DuPont, Procter & Gamble, Dutch Shell. And he's actively assisting governments all over the world and has been advising a number of governments, including Armenia, Colombia, Ireland, Kazakhstan, Nicaragua, Russia, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Taiwan, and the UK. And he also advises there's an active role in the U.S. economic policy in the executive branch, Congress, and international organizations like the World Bank. Um, in 2008, he received the first ever Lifetime Achievement Award from the United States Department of Commerce for his contribution to economic development. In 2003, the Academy of Management recognized Professor Porter with his highest award for scholarly contributions to management. 
1998's first ever distinguished award for contribution to the field of time. And he was the 1997 recipient of the Adam Smith Award of the National Association of Business Economics, given in recognition of his exceptional contributions to the business economics profession. And the list goes on. So with that, let me welcome all of you again and have Professor Ford to share for his presentation. Well, Arshad, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I'm very, very excited to be here, and I really appreciate all of you taking a Saturday afternoon and going, going and sitting in a hot room and listening to me. I really appreciate it. Um, the reason I'm in Mongolia is that my daughter, Sonia, who's a, uh, a student at Princeton University, has been working in Mongolia this summer. She's been working with the One Laptop Per Child program, and she's been teaching teachers and young two-year, second graders uh, how to use laptops. And so it's been a very exciting summer for her, and, um, and, and that, that has brought me to uh, Mongolia, and uh, uh, I have just been very, very uh, taken with the country and very much enjoyed the time I've been here. I was just up in the north at uh, Lake Sarans with Moscow or something like that. These words are so hard for, for us Americans to speak. Uh, and it's just a beautiful country, and uh, I, I really uh, have fallen in love with, with Mongolia, and I'm very pleased to have a chance to speak uh, with you today. What I'd like to do uh, today is uh, really just uh, hopefully uh, start a discussion, which I think is really necessary right now in Mongolia. Uh, I think Mongolia's had a, a, a good start in terms of transforming its economy from the uh, Soviet times, it's become a market economy, it's joined the WTO, Met much progress has been made in uh, making this a market economy, an open economy, um, but right now I think it's very, very critical that uh, this country make a transition uh, and become a competitive economy. Uh, I think the business sector in Mongolia is not very well developed, uh, the exports are very limited, uh, and there needs to be really a transformation, the next transformation of the Mongolian economy. Um, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about today, not so much about Mongolia, because I'm not an expert. I, I, I'm, I know something, I know just enough to be dangerous. Uh, but uh, I'd like to talk about competitiveness. I'd like to talk about what we have learned about building a competitive economy, what are the conditions, that give rise to a competitive economy, what are the critical policies that are necessary, and then how does a country create a strategy to be a competitive economy? Uh, you know, when, when you think about competitiveness, as we'll see, uh, the problem is that so many things have to improve to be competitive. The roads, the schools, the policies, the technology, so many things have to improve. And whenever you have something where there's many, many priorities, that's where you need a strategy. Because you can't do everything at once. You can't try to change everything at the same time. So you need a strategy. In my view, I don't think Mongolia today has one. I don't think it has an economic strategy. I think it has some projects that it wants to accomplish. But I think we have to go deeper. And I think there needs to be a discussion and a dialogue and a debate uh, among you about what that future strategy is going to look like. Uh, because if, unless some things start to change more rapidly, I think Mongolia is going to have trouble improving the standard of living. And if you can't improve the standard of living and get more citizens working in good jobs, then there's going to be more political difficulties and more pressure for people in one group to give money to another group. Uh, and that's going to actually not work in anybody's interest. So what I'd like to talk about today is competitiveness and economic development. Um, and, uh, and hopefully uh, we can talk about Mongolia a little bit in the process. I'm going to try to 
restrain myself to uh, just about uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes so that we have a lot of time for discussion. Uh, because I'd like So how do we think about competitiveness? Well, first of all, I think we all have to understand what is, what is the goal of any country's economy? The goal of any economy is to increase the standard of living for the citizens. Uh, the economy isn't important for itself. It's important because it provides uh, the opportunity to create wealth and, and that for that wealth to uh, be spread among the citizens. Uh, look at the tremendous differences in prosperity that we see across countries. This is data that looks over the period of about the last 10 years. And it uses GDP per capita, adjusted for purchasing power as the measure of prosperity. That is not a perfect measure, but it's probably the best single measure of, 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 uh, of prosperity. Um, and, and on the horizontal axis, it looks at the growth in GDP per capita. Uh, again, the compounded growth over the last 10 years. So, you know, not only, completely, you know, right now, we're kind of down on the bottom. Uh, the country's been growing its GDP per capita over the last 10 years uh, pretty well, uh, but that's partly because of some good luck. Uh, because the, the commodity prices have gone up. Because the weather's been pretty good. Because you've been able to grow the livestock herd. Uh, because the winter's a big one. Uh, so this performance in, in a world where you've had very good luck uh, maybe isn't so exciting. And part of it is a catch-up after the opening of the economy, uh, uh, given the end of, of the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, the challenge is how does Mongolia move up? How does Mongolia become more prosperous? And that's what competitiveness is all about. Uh, competitiveness is about the fundamental underlying causes of prosperity uh, in the economy. Uh, Mongolia has done okay, uh, but growth so far is very narrowly based. You all know this. It's very striking. I look at a lot of countries, it's a very narrow economy. Just a few sectors that are now uh, uh, really driving this growth. Uh, although macroeconomic policies have been uh, in general, uh, moving in the right direction, uh, the growth uh, is without uh, rapid productivity improvement is creating macroeconomic challenges that are hard to control, uh, inflation uh, among, among those. Um, and political pressure is building in the country. You know, the country's been, you know, uh, you know in, in this market phase for some time now, uh, and, and political pressure is rising because a lot of people perhaps are not feeling uh, so prosperous. And the benefits of this growth are not necessarily getting to all the citizens. Um, and what you find is that if you can't have uh, the political and the economic move together, you have a lot of problems. And that's very scary right now. Because if the political starts clashing with the economic and starts standing in the way of good policies, then of course it creates a, a very difficult a challenge uh, to move the economy forward. Uh, the fundamental thing that has to happen now, now that the basic steps have been taken, is to actually start focusing on competitiveness. Uh, Mongolia had an effort in the 90s to really focus on competitiveness. There was a competitiveness program. Uh, uh, there was a number of international organizations involved in that program. Uh, it was a, a good start, but then it kind of stopped. And, and, and the attention focused on other issues. I think now is, is a critical moment. Uh, competitiveness has to rise to the top of the agenda from an economic point of view. Because unless the country is going to be competitive, there's going to be uh, constant stress and strain. Now, what do we mean by competitiveness? Well, competitiveness is actually very simple uh, if you don't get too technical and just think about the concept. The concept of competitiveness has to do with productivity. Productivity is the output, the value of the output that can be created in the day of work. The value of the output that can be created with a hectare of land or with a given unit of natural resources. If you're productive, you can afford to pay yourself a high wage. 
if you can get a lot of output per day of work, uh, then you can afford to have a high wage. If you're not very productive, uh, then of course you may have to just uh, suffer uh, with a low wage. Productivity determines competitiveness. When we look at how countries progress and whether they're moving ahead in terms of prosperity, uh, what drives that is productivity. Productive countries that get more productive and more productive and more productive get more prosperous. Uh, countries that can't uh, tackle their challenges in terms of productivity, that can improve efficiency, that can become more productive, those are the countries that go nowhere. Those are the countries that have constant uh, stress and, and problems. Now, uh, when we think about the productivity of an economy, there's a couple of very important points that I think we all have to understand. Because I found, as I've worked in other countries, that there's a lot of misunderstanding that stands in the way of uh, a good policy. Uh, first of all, what we've learned is it doesn't matter so much what particular fields a country competes in. That's not what really determines prosperity. Uh, what determines prosperity is not what you do. What determines prosperity is how you do it. Let's take shoes. Shoes doesn't sound like a very exciting industry. Uh, many people say, well, gee, I should be in semiconductors, you know, and not shoes. But what we found is that actually you can be rich making shoes. Let's take the Italians. Italy gets rich making shoes. They export billions and billions of dollars worth of shoes a year. Why do they get rich making shoes? Well, it's because it's how they compete in that field. Italians can sell a pair of shoes for $500 a pair. Why? Because it's very high quality. Because it has wonderful design. Because it has the most, uh, the most wonderful leathers. Uh, because it, the products have good brand names. Because there's constant innovation in the products that are produced. Italy gets rich making shoes. There are many other countries that make shoes that are poor. It's not the shoes, though. It's how they produce the product. It's because they don't have any skill, there's no technology, there's no sophistication in how they produce. You can be rich in doing anything. You can be rich in agriculture. You can be rich in shoes. You can be rich delivering packages. You can be rich doing anything as long as you're highly productive. There's no country can be competitive in anything. Everything these days. The global economy is huge. There's many, many industries in the economy. No country can be competitive in everything. What matters is not what particular fields you, you focus on. What really matters is how productive you are in those fields. And that's going to have some very important implications for mobility. What we know is that the way to build a competitive economy is to build on what you already have rather than try to get into something new that you, that you know, know nothing about. The way you create new industries is you create new industries out of old industries. That's the way it actually works. Um, and we'll talk about how that works uh, later on. Uh, and the, the problem in Mongolia isn't the fields that you're in. The, the, the problem is that you're not really competitive and productive in those fields. And you haven't created an explicit strategy to build on those fields to broaden and diversify the economy at the time. Uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, further. Another uh, critical point today is in the modern global economy, a country like Mongolia desperately needs to have foreign companies investing here. The reason is that you can't invent all the technology and all the knowledge in a small country. You can't even in a big country. You've got to be tapped into the rest of the world so that you can get access to management skills, to technical skills, to distribution channels. So that you can, that, and that accelerates the process of improving productivity. What we see is that the most competitive economies have a mixture of foreign firms and domestic firms. And, and they, they work together and they compete and they collaborate in, in many different ways. Uh, in many developing countries, there's a concern that if the foreign firms come in, you know, that's bad. Somehow they're going to harm the country. Well, that's a really big mistake to think that way. When you have only 2 million people, you want as many foreign firms as you can get. Because you can't possibly produce 
all of you figures out how to produce these goods yourself. So you'd like to have those multinationals operating here who can help raise your standard and train Mongolians to work for them. And then those same Mongolians that work for the multinationals, they're going to start new businesses. That's the way it works in a lot of global economy. We also have to worry about our local sectors. There's a tendency in thinking about competitiveness to think about export sectors. But export sectors, as important as they are, actually are usually uh, only a moderate amount of total employment in, in the economy. There's a lot of local sectors, uh, restaurants and wholesalers and electric power utilities. And there's many local sectors as well. If they're not efficient, then the export sectors can't be efficient. See? You know, if, if you don't have good logistics companies, then the, within Mongolia, then the export companies are going to have a disadvantage in terms of productivity. So what we found is that when you're thinking about competitiveness, every part of the economy matters. You can't leave anything alone. You can't let any sector be efficient. Uh, you've got to have a plan that is going to drive competitiveness uh, throughout the economy, because everything's connected, everything's related uh, in terms of building the overall productivity uh, of, of the economy. Uh, fundamentally, then, the challenge for Mongolia is how to create a productive environment for business. No business has to be here. Uh, maybe some have to be here because you have certain mineral deposits and that's very attractive. And maybe because you have mineral deposits, they'll come here even if you're inefficient. That's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to have a country where people will come to your country to do business even if you're inefficient. That's the resource curse. You can do okay without actually becoming productive. See, you've got to be productive if you really want to improve your wealth. And sometimes the natural resources, it works against that. Because you can be comfortable without being productive. Uh, what we have to do in Mongolia is we have to focus now on raising the productivity. And having been here for four or five days, this is not a productive economy. It doesn't work efficiently. For many reasons. You all know that. You may have gotten used to it. But we have to create a movement in Mongolia that things are not going to be inefficient anymore. Things are going to be productive. We're going to change our mindset, our mentality, our focus, our culture. And countries can do this. It's, it's happened many times if you have a consensus and if you have a strategy. And if it's well understood among all the sort of people in, 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 in the society that this is what is the right course of action. Uh, okay? So the challenge is, how do we actually go about creating that competitive economy? Uh, you know, just very briefly, we've got to move beyond just living on our inherited wealth. We can't just uh, take the things that we inherited, like our minerals, and just sell those. Yes, that makes us a little money, but fundamentally, that creates a very unhealthy situation where the government gets too, too central in the economy. Because government is the one typically who owns the, the, the rights you know, to the members. So they collect the money and then the government uh, runs everything. Inherited prosperity will get you to a certain stage, but, but what you really want to do is move to created prosperity, where you actually enhance your prosperity because you're productive. And even if you have, even if you have uh, minerals or other natural resources, you'd be more productive in utilizing those natural uh, the more productive that you are in utilizing your natural resources, the more prosperous you're going to be. Uh, and, and you want to move uh, from the left to the right. When you're depending on inherited prosperity, uh, you know, you're very vulnerable to the commodity prices. You're very vulnerable to the weather. You're very vulnerable to the luck. And you've had good luck lately, but maybe the luck will turn bad. When you're creating prosperity because you're very productive, you're not so vulnerable. You're not so vulnerable at all. Uh, in fact, these kind of economies tend to be quite robust and stable over time. Now, you know, here's some data on Mongolia's exports. Uh, uh, you know, exports are very low in the world. Why is that important? Because in the modern global economy, it's impossible for you to be productive in every industry. You must import. 
But in order to import and keep your macroeconomic situation okay, you've got to export. And Mongolia's exports are too low. And that's basically because you're not productive enough. If you haven't created enough of a productivity environment to expand the, the range of the economy. You can see that most of Mongolia's exports are unprocessed goods. You basically dig them out of the ground or pluck them from the land. Uh, what we need to do is move to processed goods. Services and exports are growing a little bit, we primarily due to tourism and logistics. But these numbers are tiny. They have to be two, three, four times as high as this uh, if this economy is ever ultimately going to be a, to be a, a prosperous economy. Now, foreign investment has, has been picking up, and that's good. But as you see, it's overwhelmingly still in mining. Why do the mining companies come? Because they have to. They come because they have to. What about all these other people? They don't have to come. They, they, they're going to go where they're going to have the most productive environment, where they're going to make a good return, where they're going to be able to operate efficiently. Nobody's going to come to Mongolia because it's a large market. It's a tiny market. You've got to understand this. The, the reason people are going to come here is because you're going to have to create an environment that's very productive. It's going to have to be a jewel. It's a huge country with a little population that's going to have to become a jewel that attracts business. And in the beginning, that is probably going to be attracted, it's going to be related to the fields that you're already in today. Over time, I think you have a, a broader possibility uh, than we can talk about. Now, what creates competitors? What allows exports to grow? What uh, 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 attracts foreign investment in terms of uh, an attractive business environment? Well, you know, a, a, a competitiveness starts on the basis of the endowments that you have. Endowments are natural resources and location and growing conditions. But basically, competitiveness then is the environment that's created uh, to use those endowments, labor, resources, and capital, to produce, you know, output very, very efficiently and productively. In thinking about competitiveness, we divide it really into two big categories. One is what we call macroeconomic competitiveness. And that has to do with the overall policies that really affect the entire economy and cut across all the industries. Uh, uh, of course, macroeconomic policies are a critical part of that. Fiscal policy, monetary policy, you know, kind of general openness, and connectivity to the, to the world economy, convertibility of currency, things like that. Um, and, and we know a lot today about what good macroeconomic policies look like. In fact, our shot here can, can talk for the next 10, 10 years about that. There's a well-established body of knowledge, and, and, and Mongolia's been doing okay in this area, although it has some room for improvement. Uh, another part of macroeconomic competitiveness is sort of the social uh, infrastructure and political institutions in the economy. You know, we know that uh, to have a, uh, a competitive economy, uh, you know, you need basic human capacity. If people need to be educated, they need to be healthy. Uh, can't be productive if they're not. Uh, you need safety and security. You know, you have to, people have to feel safe, uh, or they're not going to be very productive. Uh, you have to have a good political institution. And, you know, lately we've hit a bit of a speed bump in terms of the political uh, stability. Uh, then, of course, you need rule of law. People have to follow the rules of the game, and there has to be ways of settling disputes, and that has to be happening efficiently and effectively. So these are some of the sort of what you might call the platform conditions. Now, in a developing country, these can be very, very challenging. Um, in, in, our, in our research for the Global Competitiveness Report, which, of which I'm the chairman, uh, we have now done some very interesting modeling, and what we find is in, in a developing economy, uh, these things, uh, the, these macroeconomic policies and social infrastructure and political institutions are very, very important in explaining prosperity. Those developing countries that can sort of master this level uh, tend to do okay. But what we find is that that's not enough. These things, this macroeconomic competitiveness layer is necessary for prosperity, 
And it helps a lot when you're a developing country, when you're relatively low income. But to get to really be a high income country, you have to develop that top layer, which is what we call microeconomic dependence. And that's the stuff that's connected very closely to business and to firms. And basically what you've got to create uh, to be a really highly prosperous economy is you've got to create a very high quality business environment in which firms can operate very, very effectively and efficiently. You need to build clusters. And we'll talk about clusters and what clusters are. A cluster is where you don't just have one or two firms, where you have many firms in the same field that are kind of supporting each other and, and related to each other. We'll talk about that later. And of course, you need very good companies. Uh, because of course, the, competitive, the productivity of an economy is sort of the sum of the productivity of all the companies in the economy. Uh, you know, some, sometimes uh, when I talk to government officials, I have to remind them, only firms can actually create wealth. Government is good at harvesting wealth, passing it from one person to another. Uh, it, it, particularly governments that have inherited wealth from, from you know, minerals and oil and things like that. But only firms can actually create wealth. Create wealth, wealth is created when a firm actually is able to produce a product efficiently enough to actually make a profit operating in that location. And, and, and that firm then pays its workers and makes money and, and, and that, that's, how, that's how wealth is actually created. So you've got to build a very efficient business sector that is sophisticated in terms of their strategic thinking and their operating practices. And ultimately, this is often the biggest challenge for development. You can, you can set the policy environment. You know, you can build roads. But how do you build a sophisticated private sector that can actually compete, you know, with the Chinese and, and the Russians and, uh, and all the other folks that are out there competing? Uh, uh, that's, that's often a very, a very great challenge. And, and of course, that's a very big challenge in this country. Uh, if you look at, at Mongolia, and I'll show you some data in a minute, uh, the business environment is, okay, it needs a lot of improvement. The, the quality of the firms, forgive me for all you here, very low, very low. The business environment is more advanced than the firms right now, based on our data. Uh, the firms are still kind of enjoying the growth that's, you know, happened almost kind of naturally as the country has, you know, opened up and so forth. But firms in this country are not yet advanced. And that's part of the critical agenda that, that has to happen. The question then is how do we put in place a strategy that figures out where we stand in each of these areas and, and moves us ahead uh, where it's the most important at this moment in history. And again, you've got to be careful not to just think theoretically about doing everything at once. You know, I have lots of firms and lots of countries I work with, they want to build research. You know, they, they, they're so excited, they want to do, build research. And, you know, research is great, but it's not the biggest problem that we have right now. Research is for later. Right now we need some technical skills, maybe we need some applied technology, but uh, this country shouldn't be spending a lot of money building a huge, big research infrastructure. That, that will come forward. That will come in the future. You've got to understand where you are, what the constraints are that are holding you to the next level, and, 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 then, and then move on those. Now let's talk a little bit about that. We already talked a little bit about this. Uh, you know, uh, one of the kind of critical things in developing countries having to do with, with uh, macroeconomic dependence is, of course, rule of law and, and corruption. Uh, you know, at least some of the rankings uh, show that uh, Mongolia is doing uh, pretty well here compared to uh, some of your neighbors. Um, sort of what I hear, though, is it might be getting worse. So it's been pretty good, but, but I think this is a stress point. If you look at some of the other indices, it's showing a little bit of a, of a decline. This is a critical, critical problem. Because again, the mining companies are still going to come. 
because they have to. And they'll put up with it, and they'll do whatever they have to do to do the deals to you know, get access to the resources. But other kinds of companies are going to be scared away. So this is something that, uh, that if you, as a little country without a huge population that attracts a lot of investment because of the market, you've got to get this right. And this has got to be something where it, it, only the citizens can get this right. This has to become something where you insist that government runs this way. And you get that message across. Uh, and, and again, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Uh, you know, we have a lot of progress on opening. That's often a stumbling block. But this country has done quite well in terms of opening. This is an openness indicator, you know, index of economic freedom. You know, you're way down. You're not, you're not over here with the, you know, with the bad guys. You know, the ones that are, you know, still don't get it. Uh, you've, you've done a lot of things. And if I, I have other data uh, that suggests, you know, actually inequality is, is not that high in, in my goal in terms of the, uh, income across, across citizens. Uh, it, it, it seems like it's, people think it's high right now, but, but it, if you compare yourself to other countries, it's, it's actually not, not so bad. You, you build it up uh, pretty well. Um, uh, there, there some other indicators I'll show you later are pretty good. Uh, but, but obviously, you can, you can still improve on all these things. Now, if you look on the microeconomic side, here, Mongolia's position is much less attractive. You know, if you, if you compare kind of your macro, you'd be looking, you know, okay. Uh, if you look on the micro, you, you try. And if you've been a part of the Global Competitiveness Report for two years now, uh, this is something that I chair. And this part of it uh, is really on the microeconomic side. And uh, the first year, um, uh, you uh, came in at number uh, 96 uh, on the micro side, um, but you can see that the rank has fallen a little bit. So again, what we're measuring is that competitiveness is actually not improving, it's actually slipping, at least recently. Now, uh, I, I was hoping that I could sh uh, talk to you about the new date for the new report that's going to be issued in the fall, I have the data. Uh, back, back at Harvard, but unfortunately we couldn't process it. So I don't know what's going to happen this year. Uh, uh, you can see that the business environment is ranked somewhat higher than the companies in terms of their sophistication. Now let's talk about the elements of micro competitiveness. First is the business environment. Uh, the business environment can be seen as really having four elements. One is the inputs to business. The labor, the quality of the labor, the skill, the physical infrastructure, the electricity, the roads, the airports, and so forth. Uh, third is the access to capital, efficient, low-cost capital at reasonable interest rates. Uh, and you can see. Uh, the basic theory is that if, the, if you're going to be more productive, you have to have better inputs. You can't be productive if the roads are bad. You can't be productive if it takes a long time to do things because you have a lot of permitting and licensing that's very cumbersome. Uh, you can't be very productive if your workers aren't educated and skilled. Uh, so basically the theory says that you have to raise the quality of the, the inputs and keep raising them and raising them and raising them and raising them. And if you want to be a really advanced economy, you've got to get to the bottom of the list. You've got to build not just the people and the capital and the infrastructure, but you got to build a scientific and technological capability. You're a long way away from having to worry about that. You need to improve technical capability, probably not scientific capability uh, quite yet. When you get to be a GDP per capita of 10,000 or 12,000 or 15,000, which hopefully will come soon, uh, then you'll have to start focusing on those issues. Second part of the business environment has to do with the rules that govern competition. We call it the context for strategy and rivalry. That has to do with the tax system, whether they're investment incentives or whether the tax works against investment. It has to do with protecting intellectual property so that people uh, you know, don't steal each other's ideas. Uh, it has to do with the uh, competition laws and whether there's uh, a lot of competition within the country. 
One of the strongest findings that we have over the years gotten many, many times is if you don't have to compete at home, then you're probably not going to be able to compete somewhere else. So anybody that's protected at home, that has a monopoly at home, that has too much market power, is almost never going to be international successful. So that says that one of the critical economic policies is always to really open up internal competition. Uh, in America, we call this antitrust. Uh, in other parts of the world, they call it competition policy. Uh, the idea is that firms have to compete fairly. They can't abuse their power. Uh, they can't agree together not to compete, things like that. Uh, so that, that's part of the environment in which competition takes place, the rules of the game. Uh, what you want is rules that favor productivity. Uh, and that's those kind of economies move forward. If you can win in this country by knowing somebody or having a relationship with a minister or being from a good family, if that's the way you win in this country, that's bad for competitors. And so the question is, have you created an environment where productivity wins, or have you created an environment where other things win? That's, a very, that's, a, that's often an interesting way to think about the state of a particular country. A, a, a third part of the business environment has to do with the nature of needs in the country. The nature of the customer and, and business needs. And the basic idea here is that to be competitive, it be benefit from having demanding customers. Customers who want something good. Customers who care about quality. Um, how do you create this kind of demand? Well, it has to do partly with just uh, uh, you know, how well-educated customers are, how knowledgeable they are, but it also has to do with some public policies. Like, for example, are there standards for quality? for various goods in the country. Does the consumer have a, uh, the ability to uh, get a refund if they get a product that doesn't work? It's called consumer protection. Uh, if you're going to build competitiveness, you want to give your consumers some power to demand what they deserve and to expect good service. Whereas if you're in a country where the consumer just kind of takes whatever you give them, that's not likely to create an environment where the firms in that country are going to do very well uh, in terms of competing uh, internationally or even in the region. And the fourth part of the uh, business environment has to do with the availability of supporting industries, supplier industries. Uh, now, this is just, uh, there's many, many data, data sets that allow us to look at the business environment. This is the World Bank uh, doing business uh, uh, finding, uh, you can see that uh, the, the dotted lines or the median ranking for East Asia and Pacific, that's a pretty high standard. You can see that, uh, you know, Mongolia does pretty well on, on some areas. And this, and Ar Arshad can, you know, recite this data in his sleep. He knows all of this much more than I. But you can see on the right that there are certain areas uh, where you see the red where, uh, you know, uh, Mongolia needs to improve. So paying taxes, so, so, you know, the tax system here doesn't make much sense. I mean, it, it has a funny set of deductions. It's it, it just, it just out of line with a competitive tax system. Uh, that's just an example. There seems to be a, even though trade is open, it seems to be hard to do it. Uh, partly because of customs processing and things like that. So, so this gives you a, a snapshot. Now, here's, here's some, some more numbers. Um, this is from the Global Competitors Report survey. We survey uh, leaders in about 120 countries every year. Uh, this is last year. And the number you see there is, is Mongolia's rank in the world among the countries that we survey. This is uh, versus 111 countries. Your average rank in, in GDP per capita among the 111 countries was number 90 in GDP per capita. So that's prosperity. So basically, if you're 90, if, you, if, you're, if you're ranked on one of these things is lower than 90, that means you're doing pretty well given your level of income. If you're ranked on something as higher than 90, that means that's a weakness. For a country you're, at your prosperity level, you should be doing better. Now, you know, there is a legacy of, some, of engineering and, 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 and scientific capacity here, which is true in many former Soviet economies. 
Uh, and I've got the analysts show that it's, uh, that ranking is, has been perceived as, as, as rising. Uh, that, that I find a little bit uh, strange, uh, uh, just given what I've what I observed and what I know. But you can see some of the things that are supposedly uh, ranked pretty well, and you can see whether they're supposedly improving or are declining. Again, no one of these numbers is definitive. What you're trying to do is get an overall picture. Uh, what you see is probably nothing surprising on the right. Uh, uh, you, you have a very low ranking on ports because you have none. Uh, so you're basically at the bottom on ports. But, uh, you know, access to loans, among the worst, you know, of any of these 111 countries. Venture capital, you know, not very much. Infrastructure in general, very low. Airport, you know, not so good. Uh, I asked earlier, is there a business school? In my bubble, the trains manager, a sophisticated school of trains manager. No, boy, we gotta get one. If, if, if being having sophisticated businesses is critical to having a productive economy, then how are they gonna? How are we gonna have sophisticated managers? They just gonna dream it up in their sleep? No, they gotta be trained. Uh, you know, we had one Mongolian student at Harvard Business School that I'm aware of. One. And we need more. You know, I had three Cossacks last year. I had three Cossacks in my class, my competitive class. Because Cossacks have a program to send students all over the world to get trained. They have a special program with Harvard. And they go, well, that's, that's the way they're spending their money. They're trying to jumpstart their sophistication in terms of their uh, manager, managerial group. Uh, you can see some of the issues. And, and go, go back and look at these things and think about it. And, and see if they make sense to you given your, your on the ground experience. In terms of the context, the rules of the game, uh, you know, not so great property rights, still some trade barriers. We're, we're sort of open in terms of formally open, but trade processes are working that smoothly. Uh, um, you know, a little bit too much favoritism, not that good at intellectual property protection on the demand side. Uh, you know, very weak environmental regulations. Again, yeah, yeah, you know, you, 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 sometimes developing countries think that they can't afford to have environmental regulations because it's, it's too costly. And my experience has been that developing countries can't afford not to have environmental regulations because it's only through environmental regulations that you start to raise your standard of practice. And when you have a beautiful, pristine country like this, it's going to turn out to be one of your greatest assets if you can preserve it. Uh, and so, you know, this is very, very nervous, I'm very nervous to see this low rank. Uh, you know, government purchasing is, 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 is not that transparent and not that quality oriented yet. And in terms of supplier availability, uh, supplier availability is very weak. Have some technical and, and research capacity, again, a legacy here, but in terms of, you know, are there enough suppliers that are they good quality? Uh, is there machinery compatibility? You know, in the country, the answer is uh, not so good. So this is just an indication. Lots of issues. Every country has issues. Every country in your situation would have uh, issues like this. The question is not, do you have issues? The question is, are you doing something about it? Do you have a plan? Is there a strategy? Have you set some priorities? Is there an action program? Is the government working together with the private sector to make things better? And the answer is, maybe I haven't seen it yet, but I think we can do better uh, in, in, in this country. Uh, this looks at the sort of overall rate of improvement in competitiveness. This is again from the Global Competitiveness Report. The countries on the right-hand side are making rapid improvements in competitiveness based on our, our data. The countries on the left-hand side of the line are not making such rapid improvement right now. This is over the last couple of years. Again, unfortunately, we're on the wrong side. Not making very rapid improvement. And again, that pretty much fits with my impression just having, having been here. Now, to be fair, I haven't been touring companies. I've been bumping up and down on the roads. Uh, now, the one thing I found here was Coke Light, my favorite drink. So I was very happy about that. But aside from that, uh, my experience has been, yes, this is probably pretty accurate.
about clusters. Remember I said you have to create a good general business environment, but then you need to build clusters. And a cluster is where you have a concentration of firms in a particular field in, in, this, in the kind of set of industries that uh, support each other in that field. And a classic example of, of a cluster is, is in tourism. Now this isn't Mongolia, this is an example from Australia. This is on the north coast of Australia. This is the city that's nearest the Great Barrier Reef. So in the cluster you have the attraction. So in tourism, why do you go somewhere? You go somewhere to see something. So that's part of the cluster. So it might be natural parks, or it might be city, or it might be the Great Barrier Reef. Okay, so that's part of the cluster. And obviously the quality of those attractions is, is important to the success of the cluster. But what this says is it's not just what you come to see, it's the hotels, the restaurants, the transportation services, the travel agents, whether you can get money. The guy last night came to me and said, well, how do you want to pay? I, I took out my credit card. He looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> you know, so the payment system is part of the tourism cluster. So you can use your credit card. So you don't have to carry lots of money on it. Um, the maintenance, property management, food supply, all is part of the cluster. Travel agents, the local transportation, the taxis, uh, you know, foreign exchange. You know. And often there are various industry groups and institutions that become part of the cluster. So in this particular case in, in Australia, there's actually a university that has a big program in hospitality management. That's part of the cluster. Because that institution is training people for that, for that cluster. And there are various industry associations and so forth. All of this, all of this is in the case. Now, why is it important to have a cluster? Well, let's take an example. Suppose you are the manager of a hotel. You're part of the tourism cluster. You're a manager of a hotel. Say you're managing a hotel here in London. Let's just assume that you are running the best hotel in the world. In London. Um, you're doing everything right. Beautiful rooms, wonderful service, everything's perfect. Does that mean you're going to be successful? No, it doesn't, does it? Because what if your guest has to wait for two hours at the airport to go through customs? What if when they come in on the taxi, the taxi's dirty and the taxi driver cheats them? You know, what happens if they go to see the museum in Yolabator and it's lousy and it has poor lighting and there's no information and it's not very clean? You get the idea? You can run the best hotel in the world and fail. If you don't, if the other businesses in the cluster are not doing their job. And tourism is a particularly good example. Because there's a lot of diff disparate industries that all have to come together. And the weakest one often holds back the whole cluster. So, that's the concept of clusters. Now, uh, let's take another example. Um, let's take uh, cut flowers. This is an agricultural cluster. And I, and I want to just show you some data first. So this is Kenya. I was just in Africa. I work a little bit with the Kenyans. I work more with the Rwandans, uh, just because of personal relationships and, and, uh, and, and sort of historical accident. So 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, Kenya exported a few flowers. These are cut flowers, fresh flowers. Uh, you see the exports in 1990 were about $30 million. And by 2006, they were exporting $330 million of flowers. And in 2007, it went up by 15%. And so far this year, it's going up by 15%. Okay? So this is an extraordinary export success. How did that happen? It happened because they built a cluster. It wasn't just some flower growers, you know, trying to do everything themselves. It wasn't just a bunch of farmers out there. 
figuring it out. They built a cluster with many growers of flowers. But the growers, that was almost the easy part. It was the handling, the transport, the refrigerated trucks, the air freight. These flowers, most of them go uh, to Europe. You can see all the supplier industries that were built around the flower growers. The irrigation, the feedstock, the plant stock, the fertilizers. Some of these suppliers were not paying firms. But they attracted foreign firms to come to Kenya to be part inside this cluster because it was a big opportunity. Uh, you can see packaging material, freight forwarders, handling agents, Grading, uh, uh, grading services, grading the flowers in terms of the quality, right? The Kenyans built a research institute not to do scientific blue sky research, but to do applied work on flowers. They built uh, universities with postgraduate degrees in horticulture, uh, training the workforce. They set quality standards, they, they, they built an industry association and collaborated to kind of raise their quality standard and exchange, uh, you know, exchange uh, uh, ideas back and forth. They built a cluster. That's what it takes to be highly productive. You can't just have folks out there, you know, all by themselves, you know, just growing stuff. It's true even in mining. Yeah, there's the mine, but what about the transport? the maintenance, the machinery, the spare parts. The, uh, there's a whole set of industries that if you have a good density of those industries in your country, your mines are more productive. And therefore, you can rise to your standard of good. So that's the concept of, of clusters. Uh, it takes a long time to build a cluster. It doesn't happen overnight. This is sort of a timeline for Australia and why Australia is now the darling of the world wine industry. Uh, and, it, you know, they started a long time ago, but look at the steps. They, they built universities in that field. They, they attracted foreign technology. Uh, they established a sort of a number of uh, institutions in terms of federations and uh, technology transfer agencies. They slowly but surely, they built this cluster. And then the exports took off. Why? Because the quality was excellent and the efficiency was fantastic. And that's what it takes to be really competitive and support uh, both exports and a rising standard of living. Now, here's the uh, Mongolian export portfolio. I have some data sets at the Institute uh, in Harvard where we look at trade statistics. And I won't go through the methodology, but, but what we do is we take all the industries in which you're exporting, there are hundreds of export industries, and we, we group them into clusters based on uh, our methodology that, that uh, we can talk about later if you want. Uh, you know, uh, Mongolia has some clusters, uh, but they're very, very weak clusters right now. They're really not clusters. They're, they're, just, they're just a few industries. Uh, most of them are producing relatively unprocessed stuff not very advanced uh, stuff. So the question is, how, how, some of these things may not even survive, like textiles. I mean, why would anybody want to produce textiles you know, in Mongolia? Okay. Historical accident. Trade ports. You know, that's the reason. That they have been here. But what's our inherent advantage there? Not, not clear. But some of these other areas, there, there are some advantages that we can build on, but right now, uh, you know, we have not built on them very well. This is quite remarkable in how small a number of, of actual export uh, clusters there are in the economy and how narrow they are. The clusters are often connected. That is, you know, the, the clusters often overlap and they share industries. So, for example, if you're oil and gas, that kind of overlaps with chemicals because there's common technology and common feedstocks and supply relationships and logistics and, and plastics is, is also closely related. Uh, if you're in agriculture, that's often closely related to logistics. Again, these are not just our guesses. This is based on actual statistical data looking uh, very deeply at the economic geography of, 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 of large economies like the US. And what this says is that when you're trying to build an economy 
Um, what you're doing is you're building clusters and then you're moving into related clusters. And that's the way it actually works. Uh, this slide is, 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 uh, is a stretch because in San Diego, of course, that's in the US, it's a very advanced economy. But you might want to see how that economy got built. And on this slide, you see the major clusters in that in the San Diego, which is Southern California economy. And if you trace them back, they all start with, they start out with just sand and sun. Good climate. And then uh, a little later on, uh, the uh, city was able to attract the US Navy's Western Fleet headquarters. So all the US Navy ships were based in San Diego. And, and the reason that happened was that the leadership uh, had a nice harbor, and they worked really, really hard to, you know, attract the Navy. And then much later on, they start, they were very lucky to start in biosciences, a little seed of biosciences. And, and the story goes that uh, Jonas Salk, who you all may have heard of, who invented the, the polio uh, vaccine. Uh, he was on a trip to San Diego and he lived in Pittsburgh. And for those of you that know Pittsburgh, it's not quite as cold as, as Mongolia in the winter, but it's pretty cold. And Sock was out in San Diego, it's a wonderful, beautiful, warm place, and he was out on vacation. And some of the leaders from the community said, look, would you, we'll give you land, and, and we'll give you buildings, and we'll help you if you would set up a research institute. And he said, yes, I guess he'd like the weather. And it was really that institute that led to the whole bioscience cluster. But what, what I think you need to see here is that these clusters are connected. The hospitality gave rise to logistics, to move the people in and out. And, 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 and then there, the, the Navy gave rise to an air, a defense business to supply the Navy. But once they built that technology, that led into power generation and communications equipment. Uh, and, and now, you, know, you see sporting and leather goods. Uh, I don't know if you have any golfers in the room, but pretty much all the golf clubs, the very high-end golf clubs in the world, are made in this region. Uh, uh, there's a company called Callaway, TaylorMade. And, and, and that happened because the pioneer of, of the new era of golf clubs that were titanium and composite materials um, uh, started his company in San Diego where kind of composite material technology merged with hospitality, tourism, and wonderful golf courses. And, and, and out of that came, came the whole new cluster in, in, in golf and sports group. So the way you build an economy is, is you first of all, you build up what you have and make it as advanced and sophisticated as you can. Uh, that's, where, that's where you have to start. Uh, and then hopefully new clusters grow out of old clusters. That's what we see over and over again. And the question is how do we do that here? Okay, I have to go quickly because uh, we're running out of time. In terms of firm sophistication, let's let's get through this. But basically, uh, you know, how do we make firms more sophisticated? We've got to raise their abilities in all of these areas of the value chain. We've got to help production improve, marketing improve, supply chain improve, and quality management, purchasing, and so forth. And, and, and this is a, a process that, again that we'll talk about a, a little bit later. Uh, in, in terms of companies here, again, the companies get pretty low ratings on, on many of the uh, things that we serve. Uh, when we think about economies, uh, we also have to remember that we have to think about multiple levels of geography. Uh, most of economic policy really is, is, is framed in terms of national policy for nations. But what we find is that actually uh, there are many, many things that affect competitiveness that are not actually national. They actually are regional or local. And so whenever we develop economic policy, we have to recognize that actually that regional economies, states, provinces, cities, often have very different economies because they have different circumstances, even though they're within the same country. This just shows you how diverse the U.S. economy is. Uh, now, of course, you know, this is a huge place. 
And, uh, you know, the, 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 as this economy gets more advanced, it's not going to look the same across the whole, the whole country. In fact, each region is going to need to find its areas where it can build up productivity. And that's going to be tough in some regions because there's very little activity there. But whenever you're setting, up, setting economic policy for competitiveness, you can't just do the national policies. You have to actually provide a lot of encouragement for each region to improve itself and, and try to build up uh, it, its economy. And, and take responsibility for that. It's a big mistake to have all of economic policy just done by the folks in the national capital. The more decentralized you can make economic policy, the more you can collaborate with multiple levels of government, we find the better things often go. One of the great strengths of the United States is that each state and each city takes a lot of responsibility for its economic policy. This doesn't wait for Washington, thank goodness. We don't wait for Washington. You see that in China. You know, you see these cities, you know, the Shanghai region. They they've really focused on building themselves up. They're not just waiting for Beijing. Uh, so I think as we, in any country that's so large as this, we have to not just think nationally. We also have to think about how to build up our regions. Similarly, we've got to think about our neighbors. Again, in the global economy, the neighborhood that you're in is very important. And of course, here we are, uh, surrounded by these giant uh, economies. And you know, just a little tiny touch of, of Kazakhstan, or it's close, I, I, it must be an interesting place uh, in the world, that little, that little spot there. So the question is, how do we integrate economically with our neighbors? Particularly since uh, our neighbors are somewhat more advanced than we are. In, in some respects, anyway. If we can have a good strategy for the right kind of economic integration, uh, that can also accelerate our ability to improve our productivity. And uh, again, I don't have time to talk about the details there, but I have some slides that you can look at in terms of you know, how to capture synergy across borders. Rather than trying to do everything within a border, how do you capture synergies across borders in, in power generation, in logistics, and, and, and many other things? Uh, you know, this is an example. I've done some work in Central America where there are seven countries, and, and basically they have a logistics strategy for the whole region. Because they understand that it's kind of silly to think about logistics just for one country, or other countries are there. Uh, you're so spread out, uh, the issues are somewhat different here, but the principle, I think, is the same. We can talk about that. The final kind of general comment I'd like to make is about the process of development. And here there's been a very, very sharp change in the process of development, uh, the way it's practiced in the successful countries. The old model is a government-driven model. Government calls the shots, government makes the investments, government decides what to do, and that's kind of the end of it. The new model of development, given the more complex economy that we're in today, the more knowledge-based economy that we're in today, is a collaborative model. You need to create a process where not only the national government works on it, but the regional governments are working with the national government. The private sector is working with the public sector. There's kind of a dialogue and a discussion about, you know, what are the challenges, what are the needs, what do we need to fix, you know, what is government doing badly, what is government doing well, uh, and that's the nature of the process. The universities are often a big part of that process as they get stronger. Uh, how do we create this kind of proper, uh, collaborative process in, in this country? My impression is that so far it's been heavily government driven. So the question is, how, how do you change that? Which is part of the way of building up the private sector. The private sector has a critical role in development. Uh, the private sector can often play, particularly if it collaborates, can play a huge role in training and supplier development, you know, educational uh, improvement and, and things like that. Uh, indeed, if you can mobilize the private sector, that, that just accelerates the, the process. 
Now, you know, just to conclude, what I've talked about is, is sort of a large body of learning about what does it take to be competitive. And the answer is it takes like thousands of things. Lots of things matter. And um, as I said earlier, that creates a struggle. Because it's not just a free trade agreement, you know? Free trade agreements are good, but that's just one little part of the overall picture of competitiveness. To build competitiveness, you've got to have steady progress on many things, you know, in parallel. And you've got to set priorities. And in order to set priorities, it's very, very helpful to have a sense for what's your strategic role going to be. How's your economy going to fit in the world economy? How's it going to fit in the general region that you're in? But what role can you play? What's realistic? Uh, and I like to call it a national value proposition. How's Mongolia going to add value? Why do we need Mongolia in terms of the world economy? What can it contribute? What assets does it have that it can build? Uh, what, what, kind of, what, what are the unique characteristics of, of the country? And believe it or not, some of the most important things are often history, culture, things like that, which give rise to opportunities that ultimately can be, can be capitalized on. If one has a general sense of how one fits, one then can start to figure out what are the crucial things that I have to do well. Uh, in order to be successful. Um, you know, uh, so you know, what aspects of the business environment, given my circumstances in this country, do I really have to put pressure on? Let's take, let's take an example. Let's take Singapore. Now Singapore, you know, a little, little tiny country, you know, in the middle of the you know, Pacific Ocean, uh, didn't have any land, didn't have a big population. Basically, all they had was a pretty good location. Because the ships had to go by. And so they said, let's, okay, we better have the most efficient port in the world. Because if we have the most efficient port in the world, the ships are going to stop here. And if we get the ships to stop, and if we can build a great airport, then maybe the planes will stop, and this will become a hub. And then maybe we can get multinationals to operate here to make this be kind of an efficient place to assemble products. And then maybe if we're really lucky over a 20, 20 to 30 year period, we can actually build a financial services cluster. You know, it's initially connected to trade, but eventually then it's connected to the fact that Singapore is a very you know, safe, corruption-free, sophisticated, highly educated environment. But, but way back when in Singapore's history, the level of education was very bad. They built that. They built that over a 10, 20, 30 year period. One step at a time. And each, and each step, they kind of knew what their priorities were. And, and that's what we have to create for, for one another. We have, there has to be a sense of where, what direction is this country going to be. It can change. It can be modified. It doesn't have to stay forever. Uh, but if we just uh, make a list of the priorities, then we're going to have a hundred priorities. I mean, I've just been here for three days, and I can tell you there's at least a hundred things that need to improve. So then we're going to have a list of a hundred priorities, and then we're not going to get any of them done. See, that's, that's the challenge of going. And so the question is, how do we develop a sense of strategy? I was just in, in Rwanda, where I had been working for about six or seven years, because I know the president of the country really well. And it's kind of an inspiring place. You know, they had a genocide. It's totally destroyed. And they got to start over. I mean, I say that like it's positive. They got to start over. They had nothing. Their skilled people were killed. Their institutions were destroyed. But they got to start over. And so, you know, we're, we've been now uh, about 10 years after the genocide, and, 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 and Rwanda's had a pretty clear sense of strategy. It's doing quite well. 
It has very limited economic base, but what it's trying to do is actually create some uniquenesses. For example, Rwanda is probably the most corruption-free country in Africa. It's very safe, it's very clean, it's very stable. It's cool because it's in the mountains. Uh, and it's, it's a landlock like you are, but it's, it's much smaller, obviously. Uh, and, and we've been trying to figure out you know, what, what could be a strategic direction for, 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 for Rwanda. And you can see some of the implications of that thinking here. For example, it doesn't make any sense for Rwanda to try to create goods that are bulky. We'll try to export They'll never be efficient in terms of bulky goods that have to be shipped on the, on the land, at least not for the next 25 years. So they're focused on more niche products, air shippable goods, uh, including, including, of course, tourists who, who come. So here's Rwanda's agenda right now. I, we asked Dr. Sam, this is the cabinet for the last week. And we're constantly refining this agenda. Given where Rwanda stands, given its state of its economy, what are the crucial things we just have to get done? You know, land use. Rwanda is a country where every little bit of land is got, it's about, it's just a tiny parcel, like one or two hectares, and there's a house on it. And there's no way to be productive in agriculture if, you know, you've got all these little bits of land and everybody's living there. So they've got to restructure land use that requires a, 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 a property licensing registration system, the ability to trade land, form cooperatives, and that kind of stuff. You can see, see the priorities. Airport, obviously, is, is crucial. Uh, there's a tremendous energy shortage in that region. Uh, need for urbanization. Now, one of the things we worked on in Rwanda was we wanted to make the capital city feel like a capital city. So we put in sidewalks. And now there's no dust, you know, like you see in every other African city. And now there's flowers planted. And our latest project is, you know how, how there's walls, people have walls and they have wire on the walls, you know, the security wire? We're going to try to outlaw all of that. So you can't put that wire on your fence anymore. Because that wire makes people feel like it's dangerous. We're trying to create a world-class capital city so that when people get off the plane and come into Kigali, they say, huh, this is, this is a very comfortable place. This is nice. And, you know, so, you know, that's something we need to do one by one. This doesn't feel like a capital city. It's not well planned. It's not neat. It doesn't give the impression that this country is competitive. So, you know, we got to have a plan. We've got to fix up our capital city. How are we going to have knowledge workers who want to live here? We can't make it an attractive, clean, tidy, organized place. That may seem incredible to you, but 10 years ago, Rwanda, Kigali was a disaster. It just took a plan. It took, it took having a consensus and, you know, making it happen. That's the kind of thinking that we need to do. Uh, again, I don't have time to cover all this, but basically, you know, to build a diversified economy, you don't just go dreaming that you're going to have an aircraft industry. You've got to start with, first of all, what you have and make it better. Uh, you've got to build clusters around your products. Let's take livestock in our you know, animal husbandry area. I mean, we don't have good fodder industry. We don't have irrigation. We don't have, there's a lot of pieces that we are missing here. We don't have good plant, uh, animal breeding capacity. We don't have good veterinary services. Therefore, our animals are not as healthy, they're not as high quality, they don't produce as good a milk meat as they could, or, or whatever else they produce. So you, you start by making the products you export better, higher quality, and so forth. Then you try to build clusters around what you're already doing. Then hopefully you can move into some related clusters. Uh, you need to upgrade your local economy. Because again, that starts to create a base of greater sophistication. If you can attract some multinationals, build a cluster around them. Unfortunately, it's going to be hard for us to attract Nestle here or you know, 
the big multinationals because we, we're so small. But we should be able to get some world class mining companies and then hopefully we can build some clusters around that. You know, the, the modern mining companies understand that their job is not just mining, that it's, it's really to build the whole, really both the social and the uh, economic wealth. And uh, so I've been advising everybody I talk to here, let, let's go out and find some of the Western mining companies that really know how to do that, that don't just mine and, and create pollution. They, 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 they actually build communities. Because that's now the standard in the world for the very best practice. Uh, and then maybe over time we can build clusters that are related to what's across the border in, in China or Russia and we can find it in new areas. It's a process. It takes a long period of time. Clusters are a very powerful way of organizing all public policies. Our export promotion, training, business attraction, and, and so forth. Uh, I found this quote from uh, David Dollar, uh, uh, which I thought was a great way to, to end, end this presentation. Mongolia is at a crucial juncture. Having completed its transition to a market oriented economy, the challenge now is to attain global competitiveness. This requires a concerted and coordinated effort among all stakeholders, private and public, domestic and foreign. I couldn't summarize it better. <laughs> That's where Mongolia needs to go. How do we put in place a strategy and a process to get there? Well, thank you for paying attention, and now let's open the microphone.